am your host, Jay Poole, and this is Pot Stirrer Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. Today, we have a very special guest. Allison K. Garcia is a licensed professional counselor and a Christian novelist. She is the author of the Buscando Home series and Vivir El Dream. She has written a number of short stories and has contributed to several anthologies. Allison has previously been on Pot Storer Podcast, and I love having her on. And listeners, I know you do as well. Allison is joining me today to discuss the first novel of the Mosaic series, entitled The Dry Depths of My Soul, which was an incredible way to start her foray into queer Christian fiction. Welcome back, Allison. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here again. So the last time you were here on Potstar Podcast, you had written the final book of the Buscando Home series, Finding Pass. But you already knew at that point you were transitioning from Latino Christian fiction to queer Christian fiction. And you're seeking to focus more on topics and themes related to your lived experiences as a queer person. Yeah. Now you've written The Dry Depths of My Soul, the first in what you've entitled The Mosaic Series. At this point in your genre transition, how has this experience been for you? To me, it feels like a natural transition. Um, I know for some of my readers, they might not be following me forward for those who are more kind of conservative. Um, Though, if they've been reading most of my books, most of my books are not conservative. So (laughs) um, they're pretty far from conservative. So um, so it's not too much of a leap, I think. But there is a lot of anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment in unfortunately, with Christians um, sometimes. So not everyone's going to follow me. I, I did get a couple emails from people. Uh, overwhelmingly, um, I've gathered a lot of new followers, and I have a lot of tried and true readers that are, are, are following with me and are really enjoying it. That is awesome that you've gotten some new people to come with you along the way. You know, sometimes when you're changing genres, like that can happen where there are some people that for whatever reason will drop off, but then you'll gather a new audience. And, you know, it sounds like you're gathering a new audience. And then there are also some who have read your previous books and are continuing forward with you. That's great as well. Yeah. And for me, it feels like a natural evolution just because this is how my, like kind of my life has been leading and what I've been, what I feel drawn to. And for me, that's like a spirit thing, like a Holy Spirit thing, like, where I'm feeling drawn to write. Like I knew when I was writing Finding Pass, I started writing the characters, Emma and Sandra, and all I wanted to do was write scenes with them. <laughs> like I didn't want to write any other scenes. And I was like, ah, oh, but I got to finish this series up, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I feel that natural like pull to want to write that. And, and it felt really good. It feels really good to write it. Um, I, I've actually already written the second book, the, These New Pieces of Me. That one is oh, going to come out next year. And during NaNoWriMo next month, National Novel Writing Month, I will be writing book three, uh, which is called Tired of Waiting for Tomorrow. So oh, wow. the series is moving. That That's awesome. So it's great to hear that there's already more. Mm-hmm. That's That's awesome. I really, I don't have a lot of book three yet. There's a very vague, very, very, <laughs> I'm a, a what we call um, in uh, NaNoWriMo a pantser. So I write by the seat of my pants. So I do not plot very much. Um, I have very little plotting happening, but I, um, I do have a vague idea of somewhat of a, of a plot for each of the characters. So like one sentence or two. <laughs> That's cool. You know, and then you just kind of let the flow continue. Yeah. Okay. I jokingly say I go into a fugue state while I'm writing. <laughs> and then I read it later. And usually I'm like, wow, this was really good. I don't remember writing this at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems to really work well for you. Thank 
thank you. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. I have to edit it a lot after, but. But yeah, yeah, but at least you can get it down on paper or on virtual paper and then mm-hmm. go on to then go back and edit and what whatever you do, just polish it up. Or so Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's what the whole rest of the year is for generally. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So speaking of the characters, so I noticed when reading The Dry Depths of My Soul that there are several characters that myself and other fans of your work would recognize from the previous series. Uh, mm-hmm. So you mentioned Sandra, uh, who mm-hmm. is one of the main characters in this book. Yes. And, and then uh, you see Emmanuel, Anna, and Lauren, mm-hmm. who, like, they were featured more in Biscondo Home, and they're now supporting characters in this book. Yes, they are. Yeah, I took this the world, the same world that I created, the Leaderville world and I I have continued it like I can see it in my head it looks not unlike Harrisonburg where I live but yeah I have like a whole town in my head uh, in my head I've, I've I've always wanted to write I don't know if you've ever read the at home in Mitford book like Jan Karen like old school like 90s Christian fiction but I really loved how she had this like whole town and all these characters and stuff and I I sort of feel like I'm doing that a little bit with the who's gone to home and now with the mosaic series like I had this ready-made town and I'm just expanding it and it's just getting bigger and and I really like it and it's really cool okay and I mean so that was one thing I did notice was that you chose to bridge from one series to the other and then you kept the same universe Mm -hmm. and so what led you to approach it that way as opposed to just starting from scratch that's a good question. Um, I feel like I really love my character and I really love this universe that I created and I didn't feel like their stories were done. And at the same time, I didn't want to keep really writing Emmanuel and Anna and Lauren's story like as much. I felt drawn to, to Emma and Sandra's story and, and I had been feeling drawn to Sandra's story especially since I think book two, the finding Seguridad, where she sort of, sort of um, starts showing up a little bit more. But in book three, like she plays a prince, you know, she's a, a, a POV character, point of view character. And um, I just, I've ever since book one, like I've loved Sandra. She was like a sleeper character. I was like, oh, I like her. I really liked her. Like just from the beginning when I created her, she was snappy and witty and broken, but putting herself back together. And she's like a beautiful mess. And so I really, I really like her character. And I don't know, I just kind of pictured her and then Emma and then they were together in that snowstorm in the third book and and finding pots. And it just kind of clicked for me. And I could see this, this budding romance happening and Emma freaking out because (laughs) she didn't know that stuff about herself. And yeah, I just, I just loved my characters and I, I wanted to pull them forward and it's not that it was easier to, I mean, it is in somewhat, some ways like easier to, to use the same universe, but yeah, I just, I guess I just really love my characters. I think that's probably the long and short of it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I could see sort of the pros and cons, I guess where I was coming from was just, so especially changing or shifting genres. So there's a couple ways I would think to approach that so you could approach it where, okay, you're making a clean break from one to another. But then in this case, you have the same universe, but it's sort of a shift of focus, both in terms of which characters you're focusing on and then also what types of stories you're telling. Yeah. And I think like, I never really thought about why I did this. I just did it. Again, this would be the pantser side of me. Um, But, you know, (laughs) but like, um, I wonder if it's sort of, and I'm just being all therapeutic and self-analyzing myself here, but like, I wonder if that's sort of how my life went. I didn't change universes when I came out. I had to change a lot of people and my story shifted and things were different and a lot of parts of my life changed, but my universe was the same. Some parts of my universe were different, but I guess I think Maybe I did it that way because that's sort of how things worked out for me. 
and it just flowed. But I never really, I never really thought about it. Actually, it just sort of flowed. Yeah, that that makes sense. Recently, I did another interview with is another author. Her name's Emily English Medley. Mm-hmm. And she wrote a book called From the Moon I Watched Her, which is also a mm. fiction book. And uh, one of the things that she said that I th- can see how it applies here is you write what you know. Yeah. And so for yourself, you had your own evolution, your own journey to discovering or to like acknowledging certain things about yourself, you know, specifically your sexual orientation there's a process to that. And you can see that in the in this book as well. Like you can see it in The Dry Depths of My Soul with Emma, where there is this, there's an old life and there's an old, like there's like, okay, what she's been used to. And then she's getting these new feelings and trying to figure out, which maybe aren't even that new, but but it's like they rise up and it's like, okay, well, what what do I do with this? Yeah, I think the Emma character like, I won't say it's like a direct link to me because Emma's very story is, is like different than mine. But I did sort of, you know, rely heavily on my own stuff and also stories I've heard. I know um, I have a lot of queer friends and I hear a lot of stories and just, you know, using my imagination to to kind of fill in the gaps. Yeah, I think writing what you know, like, and this is something that I know and that I feel in my heart. And I, I did feel really called previously to write in the last genre, the Latino Christian fiction. And and then I, I slowly felt like, you know, that's not my place anymore. But this feels right. Like, and what I'm writing feels good. And what I, and it feels like me now as, in present tense, you know? Right. I could definitely see that. And I think that there, like, you can see that transition. Mm-hmm. I don't do a lot of podcasts, but I do do another podcast with somebody. Um, uh, her, her name is Nice. I can't think of her, the name for podcast. And one of the things that she and I talked about was like, she, I guess I had written like a short story, like a queer romance. And she was like, oh, it's really good. Like, you must write them all the time. And I was like, actually, I've never written romance before. <laughs> I didn't even like the genre. And then, you know, but, and I, I came to the realization on that podcast, like, you know, as we were talking, that's probably because, like, I tried, if I tried to write straight romance, it just it was not, it was falling flat for reasons, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and, and <laughs> writing queer romance um, works, you know, and, um, and it's not like straight up romance, because I, my I, I don't know, I, I write, it's sort of like contemporary women's fiction at the same time. And like, but yeah, I like whatever genre this is really that I've been writing. I'm enjoying it. What made you name this new series Mosaic? Oh, so that's a great question. So I, I went back and forth and I thought like, should I just continue the Buscando home series? And I was like, no, I really need to like show that I'm doing something different. And like, I wanted to make it something new. And I actually went to, I do um, a queer writing group um, at my local LGBTQ center. And so I spent like a whole two hour block of time or three hour block of time just talking through different possible series names that I could come up with and the, my other friends there could help me come up with. And then I like took my top ones and I put it out there to readers. And I said, what do you guys like? And and I got some feedback and people were really nice about commenting. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I felt drawn to the Mosaic series because it's like taking these kind of like what I said, a beautiful mess. Yeah. It's taking these pieces of, of who you were and kind of putting it back together, but like in a beautiful way. And that's sort of how I, when I think of mosaics, they're not always broken pieces of things. Sometimes it's intentional stuff. But it's putting things together in a way that's meaningful. And that's sort of, I think, a good representation of my series. That's really neat. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in this book, um, I have the two main characters, Emma and Sandra. You know, Emma is like figuring out right when she's about to turn 40 that she's um, she might be gay. 
and Sandra, been, you know, she's been out for a while, but only in her, with her friend group, like in Houston, and now she's moved with her family. She finally has her family back, and she's worried that she's going to lose them. Maybe they won't accept her once they know that she's gay. And so, you know, those are the two main characters for this these books. And I have some other characters kind of coming into other books that are in the same category of kind of like a, the beautiful mess kind of a situation that will be kind of, I, I don't know by the end of the series, how many extra characters are going to be point of view characters yet, because that's the pantser side of me. But yeah, I really, I'm just, I see it running like a thread throughout the, the series. Because I think we're all beautiful messes, you know, like, you know, we we all are sometimes put together, sometimes get broken, sometimes, you know, just with life and with things and pandemics and all the other things. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, I, I think we can help each other and, and kind of be put back together in a way that fits us. Yeah, that, I can see that. I, I like that imagery of the beautiful mess. Mm-hmm. In a sense of like, like we all have had, like we've had various experiences and we have different sets of tools to deal with the things that have happened in our lives. And that's sort of what we come in with, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really kind of like that imagery. When you wrote your story, did you have a particular audience in mind? Hmm. I mean, sort of. I think, like, I see two-ish audiences, and this is not dissimilar to when I was writing Latino Christian fiction, but I really want to, I don't know if I want to use the word showcase, but, like, show that you can be queer and Christian at the same time, because I didn't know you could. I didn't know that was a thing. and I, And I think there's a lot of people out there that, have that are spiritual or or have a faith have faith and are are queer and i think that a lot of times we don't get to talk about that on either side of the the fence because there's so much religious trauma in the lgbtq plus community that being a christian is it's generally frowned upon in in that and then in in the christian realm there's a a lot of anti-gay anti-queer sentiment some of it very purposeful legislature and different things have been anti LGBTQ. And so it's hard to exist in both places. I think in a way I kind of like, I sort of see it as somebody like you can be caught between both worlds and not being able to exist in either, almost like when you're like a mixed race where you don't quite fit into either side. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of out there on your own. And so when I found other queer Christians, it was just really like refreshing because yeah. I realized I I don't have to explain stuff. I can just be and I don't have to hide any side of myself. And it's really, really nice. And so I wanted a book where I could like my characters could just be. And some of my characters are, are Christian and some of them aren't. Emma is struggling, especially with faith with her faith like and with what that means to you know be a christian and be might and maybe be gay because i think that's a scary question for a lot of people that are coming out later in life or someone that is uh, coming out and like to themselves and maybe has a faith background so i i wanted some readers like maybe some queer christian readers to feel like hey I re- I'm represented here. That's really cool. And also, yeah, I also want people to feel comfortable to like and respect uh, people's journeys. That some like a lot of queer people have left their faith behind and have left church because of all of the pain and trauma that they received. And like, I totally respect that. You know, I have people that are in, that are in the series that are going to be in that realm as well. And there's people that are reading my book and that are Christians. And that are straight, you know, maybe this will help open their eyes and like understand the community better. And also, I think it's just a kind of a good story. So I'm hoping people like it just because just on the basis of that, it's a good story. Yeah. When I was reading it, I was just thinking to myself, like there are 
people in my life that I could see certain aspects of their lives that were mirrored in this. Myself coming from a faith background, there are a few people that I know who came from that same background, who I was in campus ministry or church or whatnot with. And then they came out. There's different stories and there's different things that happened with that. Some of them kept their faith and some didn't, Mm -hmm. you know, there's diversity there, right? Yeah, there really is. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you could see a couple of examples of how that might look. One of the things that I could really appreciate, and I mean, obviously I'm on the outside looking in, but, but I could see how this could be really helpful. I noticed that the way that the story was written, it also provided guidance, guidance, reassurance, resources for people. Now, I did notice in the back of the book, and there's an explicit list of resources, right? Right. Learn more, be active. That's why I always have those at the end because I I, I bring up some big topics sometimes. And I like to have some of the therapists in me. It's always good (laughs) to have support. Yeah. And and I saw that. I'm like, that's awesome. But I also noticed even within the story, in terms of some of the resources that, that Emma and Sandra look to access, because I mean, obviously they had different struggles and different things going on in their lives, mm-hmm. but still it showed people in a narrative sort of way that there may be support out there and Because there may be people who have no idea that any of this stuff exists. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I didn't know any of these things exist like prior to four years ago. You know, when I had my my realization, you know, when I was 37 and, you know, I I was flipping, you you know, what out. But like I was really flipping out. You know, I was having pull down, like meltdown, panic attacks, like just really like whoa, what is all this, you know, and reading these theological books helped me ground myself in a way that I think if I I don't know where I would be now if I hadn't found those resources. And whenever I'm working with somebody that has similar kind of religious trauma or religious kind of uh, has been sort of repressed because of certain things, like I will share Like, you know, the book Shameless by Nadia Boltz Weber, for example, or the God and the Gay Christian or Torn, uh, Matthew Vines is the first one. I think Justin Lee is that other one. Like, those are the main ones that I share with people because I feel like it's, uh, you know, it's not something that is generally taught and talked about. And I found so much comfort in those books, reading them and, and it being very theologically based learning about the Greek and Latin roots of things like how the Bible was actually written and all of that was helped really settle me and kind of helped me accept myself really. That's so awesome to, to hear that. And I think people who are going through something similar, it's always helpful to, as you're going through something to have some resources to, help get you through it, help you think about it with more information and, you know, all of that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and I think going along with, with that is the question or the, the topic of mental health. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so like, that's, one my, of the, that's my, that's my <laughs> main thing. That's my deal. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the things that I could really appreciate because in the book, it gets sort of touched on in different ways when you look at Sandra and Emma Mm -hmm. and, you know, you have Sandra who she's lived a really hard life. Like she's lived through trauma, loss, substance abuse, addiction. You know, she's a recovering addict. She's moved from Texas to Virginia. She's seeking to reestablish her support networks so that she can continue her sobriety and basically keeping her life together. Yeah. And then um, you have Emma, who, you know, in some respects, I think it can be argued that she, in some respects, she's lived somewhat of a sheltered life. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of relationships. You know, she's been involved in the church quite a bit, which has its own 
baggage. And so, you know, and that's something I definitely don't want to downplay. She's sort of had a different type of life, but it's still, you know, she, she's hitting 40 and she's dealing with this, you know, kind of self-discovery and figuring out her identity and in particular her sexual orientation and what it will look like to live authentically Mm -hmm. moving forward. And for people that have these different, somewhat different situations, they still need help. And, and I think it shows that whether we're talking about sexual orientation, gender identity, any other identities that impact our lives, it shows that taking care of ourselves mentally is important. It is so much. I mean, no matter who we are um, or what we might be dealing with. And like, I think, and one of the things I appreciated about your book is that, you know, it, it sort of sends a message and I don't know if this was, I mean, it may have been intended, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it showed that like, okay, it should be normalized yeah. to be able to be, get help. yeah, to get help. It's okay to get help. I've had my own mental health struggles. There have been times in my life where I've sought professional help and that's okay. And I think, yeah, that should definitely be normalized. Unfortunately, in certain subcultures, one of the ones that we talk about that comes up here is in a lot of Christian institutions and subcultures and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it can sometimes be frowned upon. Right. Like, you know, just give it to God. Yeah. You know, there's that. Don't be anxious. Yeah. And, you know, don't worry, right? Like God says not to worry. Right. You know, your joy is in the Lord. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that whole thing. It's a lot of things. Yeah. I've, I've actually had like as a therapist, like um and previously working as a case manager too, I had had clients who said that the the, the church told them to t- stop taking their medication for schizophrenia and like bipolar disorder because God would heal them. And I was like, uh, oh. yeah, but you don't do that to somebody with diabetes. They're not going to be like, you don't need your insulin, Helen, you're healed now. Like, you know, they yeah. don't do that. You know, they're, they're, they're going to be like, you, you know, like we're taking this wheelchair because you're good to go. Cause they don't right. do that. But mental health is just as debilitating sometimes for people. So I think there's like a huge stigma. And so, yeah, I read a lot of therapy scenes into my work. One, because it, I believe in therapy as a therapist. You know, I always tell my clients that I'm not ashamed to also have a therapist. I say we all have therapists. It's a big chain of therapists. I don't know who the main, the biggest one is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, but like all, like if there, it should be all therapists should also have their, mm-hmm. um, you know. And so I think it's normal for me to to talk and write about therapy, and also like for my characters, they I I, I write a lot of angst for them, so they they need therapy. <laughs> yeah. It- yeah, that's the thing. You know, they have, they, there's a lot going on there. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's and real it, life, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, of course. And that that's the thing. Like, you know, I think a lot of us, things happen, whether it's internal or external or, you know, a mix of column A, column B. Sometimes we need to maybe talk to someone or even maybe join a, a group therapy or, you know, whatever the case might be, depending on what's going on. I think it's important to feel free to seek help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I think that is something that I guess I don't really think about it much when I'm writing my books because I just kind of, I mean, I put it in there because I know it's important in it. But a, a lot of times, like I said, there's, it, it just flows. So <laughs> there's less thinking and just a lot of flowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that comes up in the story is the issue of church clarity. Mm. And I'm thinking about this in terms of Emma, well, to to some degree, Lauren, but especially like Emma and her relationship with the church she was a part of in the beginning of the story. Right. We've touched on this, that there is a contingent of American Christianity that opposes people who are LGBTQ plus Mm -hmm. and you know, the idea of queer people being able to live in their truth openly without shame, condemnation, and discrimination. Right. So you'll have some churches that are very open one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like either they're open and affirming or they are not and they're going to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. 
But then you have these churches that I remember back in the day calling them seeker friendly churches. Ooh. And these are churches that advertise themselves as meeting people where they are. They oftentimes have contemporary worship. The sermons don't seem too threatening. They usually don't take divisive stands from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. So outwardly, they're very, they seem safe. Mm -hmm. But then once you get involved, mm -hmm. and then it's like you start to, let's say you try to join the membership or you volunteer or you mm -hmm. want to volunteer or work at the church or you want to be a leader or you're in a position sort of like Emma in the, in the dry depths of my soul where you're just vulnerable and you need to talk to someone. You figure that the leadership is someone you can trust. Right. And unfortunately what happens is that once you are already invested, then you find out, right. Oh, well the leadership shows themselves as non-affirming right. or sometimes even hostile. And so in general, how important do you think it is for churches to be upfront about their stances regarding sexual orientation and gender identity? I think it's really important. My, my wife talks about this a lot. She gets really pissed with what she calls middle of the road Christians. You know, the, the kind of the silent majority is another word she uses it, because there are, I think there's so much damage that can be done when you stay quiet. And you don't say things and you just kind of like, well, I know this is coming from someone who just literally said, I go with the flow. But like, you know, some things you can't go with the flow <laughs> because right. you have to actually write stuff down and like figure out what you think. Generally, there's church doctrine for stuff, too. And I think not having something, you know, it, it can be really harmful to people, especially people in, in marginalized communities, you know, like... I know when I like was excommunicated from my church, I sort of knew where they stood, but they didn't really talk about sexuality much. But when I started to do some digging to see, you know, what was there, there was the only thing that my old church had about sexuality was an old sermon with like a guest speaker with a, a woman who was a reformed lesbian. So there's this woman who's like, you know, like I was a lesbian, but God saved me from it. Uh, and I was like, mm, that's not the vibe I want. Um, <laughs> right. And then, and then the other thing they had was a, a Sunday school class promoting pretty much saying the culture and media is turning our kids gay. Um, <laughs> like that was like, I don't no. know exactly how they worded it, but that's how it was. And I was like, oh, this is not a safe space. So yeah. when I went and I found a, a, like an affirming church, like I. I had, to, I had, I was ready to like, look, like how affirming is it? Right. Mm -hmm. So when I went in, you know, I, I, I soon learned that it was like completely affirming because there's different layers in churches to how, like how open they are to gay people. Like there's the don't ask, don't tell type of churches where like you can be there as a gay person, but you can't talk about it and you right. can't bring your partner and say that they're your partner. They're your friend, quote unquote. Right. You know, right. Or like you can be there, but you have to be celibate. That's another one. Or you can be there, but you can't work with kids because, you know, you might you might do something to them or you might like corrupt them or you can't be in leadership because as a leader, you have to be not a sinner. And so there's all these layers or you can't help with communion and you can't help with this or that. So when I went to the church that I go to now, well, you can, you're welcome in every single capacity. There was no boundaries for lack of a better word, you were just like everybody else. You, yeah. You queer or not, like everybody was treated the same. And it was a really beautiful thing. And I wish more churches were like that because I think when you put up those roadblocks, you're really saying like that you're not fully loved. You can't yeah. show up as your full authentic self in this church and be a proper member of the church and do all the things everyone else is, you know, it's, it's not really fair. So I do think that people need to be pretty clear about it. And, and I, I always recommend for anybody that is queer, if you're going to look for a church, like really do your homework, look at the website. Do they have rainbows or do they have a very inclusive statement? Maybe even call and ask questions because 
it's so easy to get hurt, you know, but at least if the leadership is like on board with stuff, like there's always going to be crappy people everywhere in, in the world. Um, right. you know, people that say things or people that are well ignorant, you know, but if the leadership is okay and they are on board and very affirming, you can at least can go to those people and say, Hey, like I had a bad interaction with somebody. Um, it was really uncomfortable and they can like talk you through it. But if the leadership's not there, then it's doesn't, it's not really safe. Yeah. The idea of church clarity is something that I feel really strongly about as well, mm -hmm. because I've been in churches that are not clear about that. Like, mm -hmm. so you you go and it's like, yeah, it's very sort of milk toast in terms of the mm -hmm. presentation, for lack of a better term. But it's like, if you really dig in, and, and this is just my experience, a lot of the churches that at least I've gone to that have been like that have had underlying conservative beliefs in terms of like the leadership. Mm -hmm. But they don't advertise it because they want to be able to bring everybody in and then they're going to change them. Right. Oh, yeah. That's a thing. Like, oh, you, you come here, you know, anybody, we welcome everybody that has addiction or something like that. But then you're treated like a second class citizen. You know, oh, you're like an immigrant. But like also like this, you know, like, th yeah, there's a lot of like underlying stuff there, like a one up, one down relationship. Right. There's actually a website called churchclarity.org mm -hmm. that, and it's not an exhaustive resource, but they are, they're making the effort to try to have, have a resource to show like to, so that people who care about, who, who really feel strongly about like acceptance, like being mm -hmm. in say an open and affirming church in terms of like sexual orientation and gender identity, as yeah. well as women in leadership. Like that's mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's another thing is. too. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because, um, and I know like in the, in the Methodist church, that's the church I'm in now, there's a whole thing called reconciling ministries that is working towards because the UMC is about to split like, yeah. and, and, and because of the over, over LGBTQ stuff. And so it sounds like they're the main denomination is going with being affirming and the other churches are splitting off, which is good but also really hard, it's going to be not fun. And the same thing happened like in the Presbyterian, not PCA, because they are not affirming. That's the church I was excommunicated from. Mm -hmm. But the PCUSA, they are affirming. And they split, I think it was, they, they split off. There was like a split off at some point. Um, and they have, I think it's called More Light Ministries. Is like So different denominations have different things you can look into and find churches in that denomination that are affirming too. They're like, actively working on reconciliation and like being affirming, which I think is really nice and important because I think in our society, there's just, there are so many people in the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, it's just how it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's very important to be able to have a church home that you can be yourself in, you can grow in you can be authentic in and you're not feeling like you have to hide or, right. you, or that you have to, you're, you know, a secondary <laughs> person. Like you, there's like, Oh, you can just, you can do this, but you can't do that. You know? So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's a very important thing. Churchclarity.org. That's one resource. And like you said, also looking at the church's websites, one of the things that I've found is that typically churches that are open and affirming will say so mm -hmm. right yeah they use yeah. kind of rainbows too like it's a thing like mm -hmm. a lot of times they will fly rainbow flags that's actually one of the reasons why we had to leave our space we had a different space and the landlord wouldn't allow us to fly a pride flag <laughs> which mm -hmm. I, it was just kind of ironic because we were like very queer and so like i guess he had never like listened to any sermons, right? <laughs> like previously, <laughs> so it was like we were like a, un unabashedly queer community, and but I guess the rainbow flag was the last, you know, <laughs> that was the last straw. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we actually went and like left our space, 
uh, ended up renting a, a different space because of the pride flag. Like hopefully you're in a space where you can be more expressive and mm-hmm. all that at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. What would you like readers to take away from the dry depths of my soul? A few things. I think it's important to, to highlight that everybody's journey is different. And no matter what your journey is, you are just as valid as the next person. And your journey is just as valid as the next person's. And just like, it's never too late to figure yourself out and to get your life together in the way that you want to get it together. Like it's never too late for that. I have a friend, a really, really good friend who didn't come out till she was 60, you know? Oh, um, okay. And I mean, she's really happy now. Life is not easy, but like, you know, I, I think it's never too late to be your authentic self um, and figure yourself out. I think that's one thing. And I just hope that people can learn some things, maybe get some hope from the book. I hope they just enjoy it too. I really enjoy the my characters and I hope they really in, enjoy them too. And I, I hope they kind of feel like I do that. These people are sort of like, they almost feel like they're my family, like at this point, <laughs> you know, like, like they feel like real people. And I, I hope that they read my books and they feel like that too. Yeah. Honestly, it was a book that I really enjoyed. And I think it's a good book for whether you are in the LGBTQ plus community or not. You know, it's such a good book to read just because there's so many themes that I think a lot of us can identify with. Yeah, especially if you are in that community, I think it could be really helpful, like especially like if, you know, in different places in terms of figuring out whether or not you will come out, figuring out how you even identify, like just, you know, there's things to take away from it that, you know, I'm sure are helpful for people. And I think especially you speaking from your lived experience, I imagine that that'll make a particular impact. Yeah, I, I hope so. That's my hope. You know, I I always try to write a good story, good with with interesting characters and some angst because I love angst. My wife always says I love angst. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like it's life. That's you know, there's always life is angsty a lot of times. So, yeah, um, it is. <laughs> yeah, so I, I like to make it true to life, and I, I just hope it feels real, and I hope it feels. I just I just hope people. It, like feel something when they read it yeah you know, they get something from it yeah I'm, I'm, and i'm sure that they will i'm sure they will so speaking of writing um mm-hmm. so let's kind of quickly switch gears a little bit so NaNoWriMo <laughs> yay <laughs> yes oh NaNoWriMo is my thing can i tell you about it a little bit yes okay so national novel writing month says NaNoWriMo.org n-a-n-o W-R-I-M-O dot org. You can go on there. It starts November 1st. You should do it. It's great. Pretty much all across the entire world, from here in Virginia to Cincinnati to Bangladesh to to Australia, like every single country has, I think, has has the, uh, happening there and various regions. There's like millions of people or at least hundreds of thousands of people writing for one purpose, like each person is writing their own 50,000 word novel in 30 days. It's insane. It's wonderful. Speaking of beautiful messes, it's, it's great. And so it's a lovely place to find community. And anybody who wants to write a book and they have an idea and they want to get it on paper, like this is like a really great time of year to do it because it's hard to write a book. It's easy to just write like 10 pages and then forget about it for 20 years. So it's, it's very motivating. It's fun. You get badges and stickers. You find community. You realize you're not as crazy as you thought because there's people just as crazy as you. And, and it's really nice. And, and actually this year they're doing in-person write-ins again, not just online ones. So if you want to meet local writers, this is a great way to do it. Oh wow! Um, and you get to share your stories, you know, maybe not in all regions, but like, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you should go and like, if you, if you log on, and create an account you can find what region you're in 
and sign up and make new writer friends. And it's really cool. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I've written almost all of my books have been written during Nano, starting with VVL Dream, moving forward. I, like I have written one 50,000 word novel a year since 2012. So this will be, I think, my 11th Nano. Oh, and wow. I've won, I've won every year. And winning is, is hitting 50K by November 30th. So I've won every year. I plan to win again. And I'm actually one of the municipal liaisons, um, which is the head of the region. It's uh, two of us that head the entire Shenandoah Valley region. So um, that's why I'm a little bit of an extra nano nerd. Um, <laughs> but it's really fun. There's leaders. There's people just like you. And you should do it if you're you. Jay Poole should do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Jay Poole's listeners, check it out if you're thinking of writing a book. All right. That sounds awesome. Um, so is there anything else that you want to announce? Anything that's next for you? You know, there's definitely going to be more coming in the Mosaic series. Yeah, there will be. That, um, so next year, I plan to, to release these new pieces of me. That should be coming out, I'm going to guess, like maybe summertime. I don't have a time frame on that one yet. Also, I may or may not do like some kind of Christmas release with some friends. So maybe look out for that. I also redid the, like, I didn't redo the cover, but I had a lovely person redo the cover for Vivido Dream. So that, because it's going to possibly still being, it's being shopped around for a possible film to be put onto film, the big screen. So uh, there's a new cover. So if you guys, some people want to get a cool new cover, uh, a book with a cool new cover, they should totally order a new copy of Vivian El Dream. I've been working on, I don't know when it's going to release or when it's going to happen, but I've, or it's been sitting in the wings since 2015, but I have a really cool children's fantasy book series called Prince Miguel and His Journey Home. And I've Ooh, actually nice. like, oh, it's great. I love it. I love it to death. Um, and so it's, an eight book series and it's wonderful and I'm so excited and I've actually been working on it and, I, and I'm, um, there's movement and a, it's a passion project and I really am excited about that too. So I don't know if anything's going to happen anytime soon with that, but I'm excited. All right. Awesome. And uh, where will people find, be able to find out? Okay. About mm -hmm. Yeah. So they can follow me on Instagram, um, Twitter or Facebook on Facebook. It's, and Instagram is both Allison K. Garcia, author, and Twitter is A the Writer, like the letter A. And then I have a newsletter, and I'm not super with doing that, but that I think you can sign up for my newsletter. Um, and then, but mostly I think like social media is the space to, to find out about my stuff. You can also go on Amazon. I have an Amazon author page, and that's, um, or a Goodreads page, and that's where all my new stuff is too. Okay. And where can people purchase The Dry Depths of My Soul? Okay, great question. So they can get it on Amazon in paperback or through Kindle. And also they can go on draft to digital So you, there, it's like on a whole bunch of different formats, iBooks and different things like that. Okay, I'll, I'll add that to the show notes. Cool. There's lots of different ways. Because uh, actually I had like, I have a, a Squirrel House Publishing picked up that book. So I have a small um, publisher. Actually, oh, awesome. This one. Yeah. That's neat. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Allison, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. And as always, it was an awesome conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you, too. Thanks for having me back. Thank you so very much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, You'll definitely want to listen to additional episodes and subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime, or your favorite podcast player. And if you're really feeling Potstar Podcast, please give it five stars on your podcatcher of choice and leave a review. That's only so other people who like podcasts are more likely to check out this one. So I'd really appreciate it. Go to PotstarPodcast.com for new episodes, merch, and more. And I enjoy tweeting quite a bit, so follow me on Twitter at PotstirrerCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.